U.S. intelligence or really any intelligence agency today can frame anyone they want for a cyber attack. We know this from uh, one of the last WikiLeaks releases called Vault 7, where uh, it revealed that among the CIA's hacking tools were the ability to place the fingerprints of adversary states or really any group they wanted into hacks that were actually conducted by the CIA itself. Basically a tool to create cyber false flags for any purpose. And the current CIA director is the person that was in charge of the Carnegie Endowment when they ran or when they created these papers with the biggest private banks and central banks in the world about a, a cyber attack on the financial system and how that would push for emerging of data sharing between banks and the CIA and intelligence. The future isn't just on the horizon. It's already here. And it's far more unsettling than you might think. The essential pieces for a radical overhaul of the global financial system, stablecoins, tokenized deposits, and public-private partnerships are quietly being set into place. But what's missing? A trigger. In a revealing conversation with James Patrick, investigative journalist Whitney Webb warns of a looming threat, which is the central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Once they're fully implemented, the idea of financial privacy may become a thing of the past. Tied to digital IDs, these currencies would allow governments and corporations to monitor every transaction, tracking your every move. Under the guise of protecting against money laundering or fighting terrorism, these systems could enable unprecedented levels of state surveillance over the financial activities of ordinary citizens. What's worse, CBDCs won't replace the traditional banking powers, they'll strengthen them. Institutions like JP Morgan and Citigroup are already making strategic moves with stablecoins and tokenized deposits, positioning themselves at the forefront of this new reality. In short, the future of finance is closer than you think, and it's designed to benefit the powerful while placing your freedom at risk. For further insights into Whitney Webb's conversation with James Patrick, be sure to watch clips from the interview. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more content. Enjoy the video. It's quite clear that the way to force onboarding of a CBDC is going to be some sort of crisis, some sort of event where people uh, will be made an offer they can't refuse, essentially. Whatever that crisis is that creates the situation where people will have, you know, very little choice but to onboard to this new digital currency system, uh, it could manifest in a number of ways. But regardless of how it manifests, what the narrative is going to be is that privacy is dangerous, anonymity is dangerous, specifically financial privacy is dangerous. Those are going to be the narratives that come out of this event, and that's going to be a way to force onboarding both onto digital currency that can be tracked to stop terror financing or, or things of that nature. And also we have to know who everybody online is, or we have to know who everybody is interacting with these systems. We need digital ID. Well, there's a couple of reasons why I think they'd want to have private banks have like a major role in this digital currency system to come. If there's a private sector ent in entity banking you and managing your money, it's much easier for them to bank you than the federal government. So for example, if the Federal Reserve were to do a direct issue CBDC, it would be harder for them to freeze someone's bank account uh, or debank them in any sort of significant way, as opposed to a private company where you have, uh, for example, uh, precedents where JP Morgan Chase, for example, debanked uh, Dr. Mercola and some of his executives and didn't give any reason as to why. They just said, we can no longer uh, provide you with financial services. No questions asked. That would be very hard to do in the case of a direct issued CBDC. This is something similar to the argument that's been made uh, for social media companies censoring. They say, oh, but they're private companies so they can restrict speech however they want. But we know now that their restrictions on private speech have been a result of public sector pressure, right? So again, people need to keep in mind that this is a public-private partnership. That's the prevailing model in the United States. The digital dollar in the United States is also going to be a public-private model. You'll have the Fed, the central bank, working with the private banks that own the Fed in the United States. And that will be the, the, the partnership between them will be the system. It's not going to be all public. It's not going to be all private. It is a partnership. If the Fed were to do a direct issued CBDC, it would take them a few years to design, um, experiment, and deploy it. If you're using these existing dollar pig stable coins, those are already here. They're already on blockchains. 
Um, and a lot of those phases that would take the fit a few years have already been accomplished if you choose to use those. And if you regulate them so that they have to, for example, keep their reserves at the Fed, you know, then you're able to sort of have the same kind of system, uh, but you don't have to go through um, the process of creating a direct issued CBDC. So one of the biggest developers right now of CBDCs is this company called R3 that's backed by some of the biggest Wall Street banks in the world. Um, and they were named by Central Banking Magazine as the CBDC Partner of the Year last year. And then they're developing a litany of CBDCs for countries all around the world. But that's just one part of what they do. They have this thing they call a digital currency accelerator. And the three types of digital currencies R3 develops are CBDCs, stable coins, and tokenized deposits or dep deposit tokens. And some banks in the US have already rolled out deposit tokens. Citigroup, JP Morgan. Uh, JP Morgan actually had a research paper out last year about how um, CBDCs are inferior to deposit tokens and how deposit tokens are better. So Oliver Gale, who defines himself as the founder of CBDCs, um, has more recently co-founded a company called Fluent Finance. What Fluent Finance is, is, is you know, they attempt to create a trustworthy dollar pig stable coin that they call US Plus. And it's sort of framed as an answer to dollar pig stable coins like Tether that have been controversial for having opaque reserves. So the whole thing about US Plus is having trackable reserves in real time and, and all of this. And so it's an attempt to create a very extremely trustworthy and, and backed by a consortium of banks, a bank-led US dollar pig stable coin. So if the inventor of CBDCs is moving into stable coins, he probably knows that there's something there. According to Whitney Webb, stable coins and tokenized deposits are merely a bridge to a darker future where central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, dominate. By keeping banks involved, governments can avoid the backlash of fully nationalizing money while still tightening their grip. This mirrors how crises have been handled in the past, centralizing power under the guise of market competition. Webb foresees an inevitable cyber crisis, whether real or manufactured, as the trigger for this shift. Central banks, alongside the financial giants, will present CBDCs as the solution to the chaos. But there's more at play. The rollout of digital IDs will tie your financial and digital life into one vast surveillance network, leaving privacy in the past. What's promised as financial inclusion will likely only consolidate control in the hands of a few. In the end, it's not about empowerment, it's about stripping away rights, privacy, and the ability to choose how your life is governed. Let's go back to the interview and watch more clips to gain insights from Whitney Webb. Well, if you look at all of this through the lens of risk management from the elite's perspective, let's take the words of Larry Fink, for example, of BlackRock, who's been obsessed with risk management his whole career. He has a quote, he's on video saying um, that, he, that the markets do not like democracy. Democracy is messy. They like totalitarian governments because the risk is low. Elon Musk is the, one of these figures that's trying to sort of uh, position himself as a, a free speech champion and one of these figures uh, that's on the populist right. But in reality, a lot of the policies that Elon Musk promotes, like carbon taxes, for example, um, have traditionally been uh, policies promoted like the World Economic Forum and entities like this that are seen as being uh, globalist and not populist in nature. Uh, people forget that Elon Musk is someone who whose business has uh, depended to a large degree on government subsidies, and currently a lot of his companies either depend on uh, mass adoption of electric vehicles via uh, policies linked to the Sustainable Development Goals to phase out fossil fuel vehicles, um, or they um, are contractors for the Pentagon and intelligence, like SpaceX. I think there's essentially a consensus that some other, uh, some other very significant financial crisis is in the cards for the next several years. And if you are the big banks and you know that's going to happen, you probably want to avoid a scenario like what happened in 2008, where the public knew that you were the source of the malfeasance and the economic problems, which of course spawned movements like Occupy Wall Street. If you want to avoid that, how, it, what is the best way to absolve yourself of any sort of blame for mismanaging or losing people's money? If you can say that hackers took it, 
then you're totally absolved and whoever the hackers are the ones to blame. And um, U.S. intelligence or really any intelligence agency today can frame anyone they want for a cyber attack. We know this from uh, one of the last WikiLeaks releases called Vault 7, where uh, it revealed that among the CIA's hacking tools were the ability to place the fingerprints of adversary states or really any group they wanted into hacks that were actually conducted by the CIA itself. Basically a tool to create cyber false flags for any purpose. And the current CIA director is the person that was in charge of the Carnegie Endowment when they ran or when they created these papers with the biggest private banks and central banks in the world about a, a cyber attack on the financial system and how that would push for a merging of data sharing between banks and the CIA and intelligence. So I think one of the reasons they want this new system that ultimately amounts to a control system is because they see it as the ultimate form of risk management. So you surveil them constantly, uh, you can turn their money on and off, you can turn their access to services and really anything else on and off as well under the digital ID functionality. Um, it's uh, a way to keep people in line in a way that didn't exist in you know feudal Europe and under that model. But they're clearly moving uh, to that model. And it's interesting because the UN essentially admits that. They talk about the acceleration of the adoption of all these um, of all this digital infrastructure is exacerbating the wealth gap and making the billionaires even more wealthy. But the billionaires and the bankers are the people that are designing all these UN policies. You know, people, um, you know, like Mark Carney, Mike Bloomberg, Bill Gates, um, all of these guys are the ones influencing these policies more than anyone. They admit that they're exacerbating the wealth gap, but we're full steam ahead on on these policies anyway. So, I mean, they're obviously going to keep exacerbating it. And a lot of those guys that are designing and maintaining the technology or deciding what it does are going to be in a very different class than the rest of us who are, you know, having this, te this system imposed upon us. We're not the ones designing it. We don't have a, a stake in the stakeholder capitalism model. As Bitcoin nears a bullish engulfing pattern for the first time in 18 months, there's growing optimism for its long-term outlook. Yet, this rise also signals potential volatility ahead, echoing Whitney Webb's concerns about the future of finance. With Bitcoin's open interest surging to $35 billion, it's clear that the futures market is playing a significant role. However, despite this surge, flat funding rates suggest that perpetual traders are still hesitant. Webb warns that while Bitcoin's rise reflects market dynamics, it also foreshadows a larger shift, one that could lead to financial systems controlled by a few powerful players. The combination of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, and digital IDs threatens to erode privacy, setting up a future where surveillance and centralized control reign supreme. As institutions tighten their hold on digital assets, Bitcoin's current market movements might just be the beginning of a transformation that sees financial freedoms diminished. With technical indicators hinting at short-term corrections and spot traders aggressively selling into resistance, the future of decentralized finance remains uncertain, dominated by forces far beyond mere market cycles. The question now isn't whether Bitcoin will continue to rise, but what kind of world will be built in its wake? As we wrap up, what do you think about central bank digital currencies? Will they safeguard financial privacy, or are they a gateway to greater control? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this video thought-provoking, be sure to share it, give us a thumbs up, and hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more insights. Thanks for watching.